chapter. Let's turn in our Bibles to Matthew 13. We're looking at verses 1 through 23 this morning. Title of our study, The Parable of the Sower. Matthew 13, The Parable of the Sower. On the same day, Jesus went out of the house and sat by the sea. I could just meditate on that verse for an hour. I don't have much to say about it. I just like to put myself in the setting with him. Not just because it's by the sea, although you know, but because he was teaching there. Great multitudes were gathered together to him, so he got into a boat and sat. And the whole multitude stood on the shore. Then he spoke many things to them in parables, saying, Behold, a sower went out to sow. And as he sowed, some seed fell by the wayside, and the birds came and devoured them. Some seed fell on stony places where they did not have much earth and immediately sprang up. But because they had no depth of earth, when the sun was up, they were scorched. And because they had no root, they withered away. And some fell among thorns, and the thorns sprang up and choked them. But others fell on good ground and yielded a crop, some a hundredfold, some sixty, and some thirty. Lord, give us wisdom, insight, understanding, application for our lives as we look at this oh-so-familiar and oh-so-essential parable this morning. Touch every mind and heart as only you can through your word and by your spirit we pray in Jesus' name. Well, this parable, the parable of the sower, and though many of your study Bibles probably call it the parable of the soils, Jesus calls it the parable of the sower, so I decided to stick with him on this one. Anyway, this parable of the sower may be the most familiar parable of all Jesus spoke. It is the first of seven in Matthew 13 and fifth of 20 in Matthew's gospel. Mark will share seven of the very same parables and he adds two more. Luke shares 11 of the same and he adds 17 more making 39 parables in all. Now, not only is this parable the most familiar to many of us, it is the most essential to anyone who's trying to understand Jesus' teaching, especially regarding the parables, because we learn in Mark's gospel that this parable, the parable of the sower, is the key to unlocking the others. Interestingly enough, Even his disciples had some confusion over what it all meant. So it isn't enough to hear the parable. We need Jesus' explanation of it. Jesus' uh, exposition of what he was doing, why he was doing it that way, and what it means to each of us. It's Mark 4, 13. Do you not understand this parable? He tells them. How then will you understand all the parables? This particular parable will answer many of our questions and address many of our concerns. I'm sure, like me, you've wondered, why is it one believer will hear the word and uh, and profess faith in Jesus and then not long after just say, well, I don't really believe that anymore? Or how is it that some hear the word and it just doesn't register at all? Or some get going and they seem to really be doing well. And then all of a sudden just too busy for the things of God. And when I say some, we immediately start to think of people we know out there. But we really should be starting with, could any of those things, do any of those things happen to me? Well, Jesus is going to explain how all that happens and why. Some stumble when persecuted, others Well, they just get enamored or busy with the things of this world, those things that are temporal, but most of them essential. Some 
struggle continuously in their sin while others just flourish and grow and will rightly represent him. Well, the sower we will look at plants the seed and the seed is the word of God. The soil, the hearts of men. Those three are so important. If you didn't learn anything else or don't from this point on, you need to know that God's word is good seed. And he's really the planter. We assist him in the process, just like he said, well, you know, I am the light of the world, he said. Then later he says, you are the light of the world. We haven't replaced him as the light. We're simply shining for him in a very dark and desperate generation. He said he's the good shepherd, and we who care for others, our family, our fellowship, well, we are under shepherds. We are following in his footsteps, doing the same work he did with his disciples as we disciple our own families and this fellowship. So the, the sower, Jesus in this case, plants the seed, the, the, the seed is the word of God, the soil, the hearts of men. And it will turn out that the condition of the heart will for the most part be the deciding factor in how things go when the truth of God's word is sown. Now, it's important to know that not all of the seed is the same. It's all good and it's all true. But the gospel, the seed of the gospel, is the power of God to salvation to all who believe. So if you believe that Jesus died for our sins according to the scripture, was buried and rose again the third day according to the scripture, that knowledge is enough. If you spend any time dwelling on it, if he died for our sins, that means we're sinners and that our sins separated us from him. And, and, or he would have never had to die for our sin. If there was any other way to be reconciled to the Father, Jesus would not have gone to the cross. All of those things are implied in those simple statements. Died for our sin, buried, and risen again. Now, that message is absolutely essential because you can't disciple those who are dead in trespasses and sin. You can't feed the dead. You can't encourage them except to encourage them to find life, to give the Lord a chance to give them the life he died to provide. Not all the seeds the same, of course. If you're in need of wisdom, that the seed of the Proverbs will give you the wisdom you need. If you're in need of comfort or know others who are, well, the seed of the Psalms will give you comfort and something to comfort others with. And so each portion of the word, the prophetic portions, they are, are meant to give us insight into what's happening now and what is going to happen next. In fact, this week, uh, Wednesday night, uh, we'll be looking at the latter part of the book of Daniel where we will transition from Antiochus Epiphanes who just wrecked havoc on the Jews and on the world prior to Jesus' first coming, and Antichrist, who will do the very same things before the second coming of our Lord and Savior, Jesus. So in all these things, the sower's consistent, the seed is consistent, the variable is the soil, which we will learn, and already I've kind of let the cat out of the bag, uh, it is in fact the, um, the hearts of men. Well, the disciples, verse 10, came to him and said, why do you speak to them in parables? He answered and said to them, because it has been given to you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven. But to them it has not been given. For whoever has to him more will be given and he will have an abundance but whoever does not have, even what he has will be taken away from him. Now, before we get into the why he's speaking in parables, what actually are parables? They're simply natural, common illustrations with supernatural, spiritual, uncommon applications. Uh, it's the familiar explaining the unfamiliar. 
because they're in an agricultural uh, situation. That was the, the basic form of income for the large portion of people. Well, well, he uses a lot of agricultural illustrations, but he doesn't limit himself to them. And one of the things that we learn about parables and learn from parables is that the children could understand them. And only scholars seem to have any problem with them. Everyone else, well, the common people heard him gladly. It had to be a delight when so many people were teaching. And when they did, they'd say, well, as Rabbi Hillel says, and as Rabbi Shimei says, and they're just busy quoting what men said about the word of God. And Jesus comes along and he's like, you've heard it has been said, but let me tell you how it really is. But I say unto you. Well, explaining the unfamiliar by taking those things that we're so familiar with. It's a revelation as well as illumination. And, and, and as he does so, the purpose is clear. Just as a door provides and limits access, the parables reveal to the one who's seeking, who wants to know, who desires to understand, while it conceals from those who are just hanging out, those who were mocking, those who were enemies of Christ. So one man would hear it and he'd say, I totally get this. And another would hear it and it says, ah, just a bunch of gibberish. Just stuff for children, just stuff for kids. Let's get back to the scholars. And so uh, Jesus never claimed to be a scholar. In fact, I, I, I remember a, an old fellow from the South saying, you know, Jesus don't have no PhD. And, uh, and I, I don't know if that's how he said it, but that's how I envision it. And, and somebody said, well, how do you know? He said, well, he don't quote nobody. And so uh, anyway... He goes on to say, therefore, I speak to them in parables, verse 13, because seeing they do not see and hearing they do not hear, nor do they understand. The question we have to ask is, is that his desire or theirs? And of course, we'll always come back to this reality, knowing that God so loved the world he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life, knowing it's not his will any perish, but all come to repentance. I never read a passage where he's saying, well, you know, they're looking, but they can't see, and they're, they're listening, but they can't hear, and, and their hearts just aren't really in tune, as if that were somehow his desire, or his plan, or his will. Listen, if he didn't want to reach everyone, he would have just gathered a few people and talked to them. But he spoke openly, so anyone who was hungering to know more, they would follow the disciples after. Why? Because commonly as Jesus taught, not just parables, but so many things he taught, the disciples would follow up as they're, you know, like us, he's talking and they're nodding and they're like, right, that's it. Yep, listen up now. Come on, you hear him, don't you? As that's all happening, they would go into the room with him later and say, hey, what in the world were you talking about out there? Because no one wants to admit they don't know, but in the privacy of time alone with him, they often did so. Anyone who was thinking the same, instead of saying, ah, oh, you know, doesn't seem to know what he's talking about. They'd be like, I've never heard anything like this. I have to know more. I need to understand. And that still happens today. Some people, they come, they listen to the worship. They might even sing along because it's a couple Christmas songs. And, and, then, and then they'll be, you know, listening to the Bible study, but they'll say, it really doesn't apply to me. It really doesn't make any sense to me. If that's the case, well, then what happens is, if that's you, you'll leave without any understanding or without any transformation. But if you're like, I don't really get all this, so come and ask. Get together with us. Let's talk about these things. Let's reason together. Well, in any case, he says, I'm speaking in parables because 
they're, they're, they're seeing, but they don't see. They're, they're listening, but they don't hear. They, they don't understand. And in them, the prophecy of Isaiah is fulfilled, which says, hearing you will hear and shall not understand. Seeing you will see and not perceive. Someone mentioned that the penalty for their sin was to be left in their sin. For the hearts of this people, Jesus says, verse 15, have grown dull. Their eyes, or excuse me, their ears are hard of hearing. It's about to be like, you know, smell the color nine moment. But uh, anyway, their ears are hard of hearing. Their eyes, they have closed. That's important. This is a willful decision not to look further or look deeper or listen beyond what they'd already heard. Lest I should, they should see with their eyes, hear with their ears, lest they should understand with their hearts and turn so that I should heal them. To turn means to repent. And repentance leads to life if it's repenting from unbelief if it's repenting from rebelling and running from the only one who can save you from your sin and give you everlasting life. He begins there, but he never stops there because there's day by day growth in grace. And we grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus. The word of God is the only food, the only fuel for a living soul spiritually well again not his will any perish but all come to repentance and then he tells those disciples but blessed verse 16 are your eyes for they see and your ears for they hear for assuredly I say to you many prophets and righteous men desired to see what you see and did not see it and to hear what you hear and did not hear it Jesus welcomed any who desired to understand, who really wanted to get it, and he's still doing that today. Verse 18, he begins to do an exposition on his illustration. This is where we'll get understanding and application. We'll, we'll get exactly what he was intending them to learn, and then he'll even tell us what we need to be doing about it. Therefore, hear the parable of the sower. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, then the wicked one comes and snatches away what was sown in his heart. This is he who received the seed by the wayside. So this first heart is going to be a heart by the wayside. The wayside, by the way, was simply the well-beaten path that people walked on. And so seed would be sown. They could have seen this any day. They might have been looking at someone up on the hill and they would have a flat section and uh, carved in and they could have at the very moment. He may have noticed someone up there casting seed and the birds dropping down and gathering up that which didn't fall in the good soil. A wayside heart is a hard heart because it's the beaten path. And we do find great illustrations. I don't know if we should call really bad things great illustrations, but they're, they are clear illustrations of people who, well, they, they didn't just have a hardened heart, they hardened their heart. Pharaoh is such a man he hardened his heart, refusing to obey the command of God. Let my people go that they may worship me. Let my people go so they can serve me. And Pharaoh's like, I don't know the Lord, neither will I let these people go. And again and again and again in that story, there in Exodus, Pharaoh hardens his heart. Now, some have been confused by the fact that it also says that God hardened Pharaoh's heart. And the question again arises, well, then if God's hardening his heart, God must not want him to soften it. No, that's not the case. But, but here is, is the case. The word for hardened, when Pharaoh hardens his heart, it tells us it's a willful thing. And the idea is 
he heard God's word, God's command. It was simple. It was clear. He didn't need anybody to interpret or explain it. Let my people go. He got it. But he refused to do it. And that was like a little callous over his already uh, hardened heart. And then he hears it again and he refuses to do it. Another little callous. The layers are building up. Now, if you're gardening, calluses are great. But if you're listening to the word of God and you harden your heart against it, and, and we're all capable of that because we can be listening. I know you've had this experience and you're thinking, yep, I know somebody that really should have heard that. And, and I just wish he would be listening right now. And, and we can go through that. And then all of a sudden it's like, wow, you know, an arrow from the Lord pierces our own heart. And we have two choices. We can say, Lord, forgive me. Make me right. You know, show me what you want me to do, as Saul did there on the Damascus Road. Who are you, Lord, and what do you want me to do? Well, you either harden your heart or you soften your heart. And, and, and the heart, again, if it's soft, the seed is going to take root and produce fruit. So Pharaoh hardens his heart again and again and again. Now, the, Jesus mentioned that the birds of the air, you know, and, and, and again, uh, you know, he'll explain that that's really about Satan grabbing the good seed before it can take root, before it can even be kicked along to the part of the soil where it might actually take root. Satan had some ambassadors, some some. Uh, minions, if you will, although I really like those cute little minions. I should never call demons minions. But Satan had some who were attached to Pharaoh. And, and they, they actually spoke through the men who served them. Those men were on staff as counselors to the king. They were magicians and, and soothsayers and such. And, and so Moses is instructed to throw down his serpent, does so, and, uh, and they're like, ah, oh, don't worry about that. We can do that. And they cast down their, their yard sticks, their, their walking sticks, excuse me, and they become serpents too. Now, how that took place, only God knows for sure. I did have a friend some years back that showed us how it could have just been a trick. And he actually, you know, demonstrated it. He was a guy who'd been into magic and then came to Christ. So he's like, hey, most of what these guys do can be fake. And I think most magic is. But we don't know in this case if, if this was a demonic illustration of, of the power of Satan or if it was just a trick. Either way, Pharaoh looked at that and said, well, not, not going to worry about that then. Of course, Moses' serpent ate up their serpents. And so that should have been a sign to him. But he hardened his heart and he hardened his heart and he hardened his heart. And the, the price of all of that was that everybody suffered. They suffered loss. They suffered pain. They suffered the death of their firstborn. Every household where the, the lamb hadn't been slain and the blood wasn't applied saw the death of the firstborn. And, and so because families lived together, this wouldn't be one death in a large family. It would be multiple deaths because my father was a firstborn, I'm a firstborn, my firstborn son is a firstborn. So, it, you know, if you had a few generations together, a whole lot of people could have died that day. Great grief. All of it could have been avoided. What would Pharaoh have to do to avoid it all? Just say, okay, they're your people. I get it. I kind of liked having them around, but they're yours. Let them go. Pharaoh continually hardened his heart. When it says that God hardened Pharaoh's heart, it's a word that means to confirm or affirm one's decision. And uh, God's not at all unjust. If someone says, I don't love you, he says, but I, I love you. And, 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 you know, we love him because he first loved us. Some people hear that he loves them and they don't love him back. He doesn't force that issue. And, and here, here's the, the good side of that sort of sad reality. He confirmed Pharaoh in his decision to resist him, to rebel against him in spite of all the suffering it brought on his people. 
But in the same way, when we set our hearts to serve the Lord, when we say, Lord, I just want to do your will, you know, the, the spirit's willing, but the flesh is weak. Confirm me, strengthen me, fill me, use me. He affirms that as well. He will make possible for us to do all the good that's in us. He'll strengthen us in our conviction to serve him and represent him, just as he strengthened Pharaoh in his conviction not to do either. Well, you know that Eve had a direct confrontation with Satan himself. And Satan's MO is clearly laid out in that encounter. We don't have time to go back to it, but I'll share you the lowlights. I don't want to call them highlights, right? And so uh, anyway, he first questioned the word of God. Did God say? And I want to say that this is how he's working today. Did the Bible, did God actually say that? And, and is that actually what he meant? And you hear all these things just written by men, too many interpretations, no one can understand it. And yet he holds us responsible for understanding it and responding appropriately to it. How could we possibly have an appropriate response if we can't understand what's in his word? When I communicate with my kids or my grandkids, they know exactly what I'm saying. Now, my sons messed with me a lot. I was younger and not as wise. But I'd say, hey, you guys need to go out and get us some bread and milk. And they'd come back with potato chips and, and Cokes. And I'm like, hey, I said bread and milk. I said, oh, we thought you said something to eat and drink. And, and so... They're, but it's clear, bread and milk, we know what it is, right? And that's what goes on in Scripture. People who say they can't understand it are trying not to. And you actually have to try hard to not understand God's word. So he challenged God's word, then he flat out denied it, lying, because the ultimate of all God told Eve, told Adam, and then Eve got the message too, was that in the day you eat of that forbidden fruit, you will die. So he's saying, I don't want you to do this. Imagine it. They live in a perfect environment. They've never known sin. They've never known shame. They've never known pain. They've never suffered. They've never struggled. They just get up and enjoy fellowship with God and all the beautiful things in the garden. And then there's one thing he says not to do. And, and for whatever reason, she just can't bring herself not to go and look at that tree. So that's the tree I'm not to eat of. That's the tree that brings death. They didn't even know what death was. But he said, there's something I don't want you to do. And there's a good reason for it. He didn't want them to experience the, the results of sin. He didn't want them to know good and evil experientially. They knew good, but he didn't want them to experience evil. And Satan actually took that and used that against Eve. God's just trying to keep you from an experience he doesn't want you to have. You can take something that's an absolute good thing and use it in a such a bad way, and that's what the enemy does. He takes something that's true. God doesn't want you to experience that, but he makes it like God's keeping something wonderful from you, for in the day you eat, you will be like God. Listen, I've shared it before. They were as much like God, more like God than any of us have ever been because they were created by him and lived in perfect fellowship with him. There was nothing to separate them until they sinned. And in the moment she believed the lie, believed the liar, embraced the lie, well, she ate and died. And then Adam followed suit. So Satan steals the seed. That's the whole point. It's not true, or it's not what he meant, or it's not for you, or at least not now. You have other things, better things to do. He goes to a second illustration. So the first just says, when the seed falls, and it falls on the wayward path, there's hardened 
uh, soil there. It's not really considered soil. It's just the path. And he says that the enemy's going to be right there to snatch that seed up so it can never get roots and never produce fruit. But he who received, verse 20, the seed on stony places, this is he who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy. I read this and I can think of a dozen people that I knew early on and sadly way more than that that I've known since who did this very thing. They heard the same gospel that changed my life, that changed my wife's life that changed my sister's life, that changed my dad's life. And I was first, I watched all these people in my family, one after another, come to Christ. And then so many people, friends and, and people I fellowship with and people that I knew from the past, I saw so many people over those first three years come to the Lord. But there were many like this. Immediately after hearing it, they're like, oh man, this is the greatest news ever. I can be forgiven every sin. I can be given eternal life in him. That sounds great. But verse 21 says, yet he has no root in himself, but endures only for a while. And when tribulation or persecution arises because of the word, immediately he stumbles. The second heart would be a shallow heart then. There, there's a little bit of soil, but not a depth of soil that will allow for that seed to take root. It's a seed that's planted in a heart that can't take the heat. And it's interesting that in the original illustration that's just in those first verses, the very sun that is necessary for growth and vibrancy and, and reproductive fruit, that sun scorches the seed that fails to get rooted. Now I was thinking about this. A seed is never more vulnerable than right after the point where it germinates. Because, because as long as it's a seed, it can go forever. And, and may still at some point be germinated. You probably heard the stories. They find jars of seeds in Egypt and other places. They know those jars have been there for a couple thousand years. And they, they take the seeds and they put them in water and they germinate immediately. So that can happen. But once it's germinated, it is most vulnerable. It could still be eaten by the birds. And it could still fail to find deep, good soil. And if there's no root, well, too much rain, it'll wash away. Too much sunshine, it'll burn up. And that's exactly what he's saying will happen. The seed never takes root. And so it never produces fruit. And the point of sowing is always a harvest. And there, there's good news, good application in that for us because when God plants the truth of his word in our hearts, he wants a harvest of rightness, of righteousness, of, of understanding and, and a life that blesses others and pleases him. My pastor called them 4th of July Christians. You know, they're like, whoa, look at that. They're like fireworks. They're so shiny and bright and happy and jumpy and all that stuff. And then you see them a little while later, and they're like, who's that guy, Eeyore, right? Just kind of walking along. And, 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 and there, there are so many people tragically like that. They celebrate the truth. But once they realize there's a cost, not the cost and price Jesus paid. We share that up front. He died for your sins. There is a cost. You can't die uh, you, you can't live for him without dying to self. You can't live for him without dying to your sin. You can't, you can't be in the light and in the darkness. And, and so Jesus kind of made this clear and simple. He, he's saying they endure for a while, but when tribulation or persecution arise, because of the word, immediately he stumbles. Jesus already said earlier on in this world you will have tribulation be of good cheer I have overcome the world 
If they hate you, no, they hated me first. Blessed are you when they revile and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my sake. It's amazing to me that we're shocked when we do good and people don't appreciate it. In fact, we do good and they do evil in return or they call our, our good evil. We shouldn't be shocked. That's exactly what Jesus said we should expect. I'm delighted when I share and people actually embrace the truth and they're, they're on fire for the Lord. And then I get to watch them walk, not just for a week or a month or a year, but for decades with the Lord. You get to see the fruit that happens in their lives and then their families' lives. That's really what we're looking at here. Well, as far as tribulation goes, as far as persecution goes, Nebuchadnezzar in his day, Caesar in Jesus' day, they both wanted and demanded worship. And the penalty for refusing to worship their image or their person was death. Antichrist coming soon will do the same. Verse 22, now he who receives seed among the thorns is he who hears the word and the cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word and he becomes unfruitful. This is the, the thorny heart or the, the, the heart that's just encumbered with, with weeds and thorns and such. Now, cares of the world, not necessarily sinful. That they school, friends, work, family, even church, they all occupy our, our thoughts, our time, our energy. And so we're concerned about them and should be. But there are some cares that are just foolish. You know, some people are so worried about what others think of them, they never think about what does God think of me? Or God gives you a message, and you, you felt this, I'm certain, at some point. If not, I'm going to pray you do, because it's a really good thing. You sense that God's saying, I want you to talk to that person. You're like, I don't even know that person. I, well, I want you to talk to him. My dad said not to talk to strangers. You're 40 years old. Get over it. Here's the point. God does impress upon our hearts to share. And when he does, there's a battle that goes on within. Well, what if I offend them? Or, or what if they misunderstand? They like me now. What if they reject me? We worry too much about what people think of us and not enough about what God would say to us. Consider this. If this were our last day on planet Earth, we would stand before him. The last breath here, first breath there. We open our eyes, we're there in his presence. And, and in that moment, everything we could have said or could have done or should have said and done, well, those opportunities will be behind us. And I know I kind of go this direction every time, but it's because the world is perishing in sin. And when I think of the world, I don't just think of the world way out there somewhere. I think of the world way close in. Our neighbors, our schoolmates, our our friends, those we, we fellowship with and, and, you know, all of the different people in our lives. So some cares, not sinful. Other cares are sinful. Either way, too much of either can choke out the good seed of God's word. The deceitfulness of riches has led many into sin and by the way, covetousness is idolatry, and I don't think there could be a sin more offensive to God than worshiping things he made and gifts he gave instead of him, himself. He alone deserves our worship. He alone deserves our allegiance. So for some people, you get it, it's position or it's power or it's possessions. For some, it's just the latest or newest anything. We're in that generation. Whoa, you know, there, did you know there's a, an iPhone 429 or whatever it's going to be someday? But, but I was thinking, if you wanted to 
well, I can't call it having a little fun, but if you wanted to do something interesting, do it yourself and then find some others and do it. We get together with some people, say, hey, can you finish this phrase with just a word? Happiness is what? And, and I was thinking about it, you know, I'm going to do it because, you know, then, then you find out at least what the grandkids really want for Christmas. But the, the point is, if you say happiness is what? What will really bring joy? What will really bring contentment? And, and I want to say, you know, if we did it as a test here, you know, we had a little exit poll as we go out, right? And every, somebody's out there writing it down. So happiness is, it would be like Jesus, uh, yeah, uh, grace, you know, giving, doing, happiness is, you know, kindness. We'd have all right answers. But I'm saying if, if we, in our heart of hearts, sit down and say, what really makes me happy? What am I pursuing? What am I spending my time and energy and thoughts on in the hopes that that will lead me to some kind of contentment? You know, John Lennon sang a song that said, happiness is a warm gun. And ironically, he was shot to death by someone who thought the very same thing. And I wonder what John thinks now. Well, it was early in the book of Joshua, just after the walls of Jericho had fallen. Joshua sends some guys up to a little city called Ai. It's no fortress. There's no high walls. There, there's not this great massive army guarding it. And and, and, and he sends some spies, and they come back, and they say, hey, we got this one. You know, let's, let's just go up and take it. So they take a small contingency, a few thousand people, and they go up, and it does not go well. Why? Because there was sin in the camp, and there were a couple missing pieces. The, the sin in the camp was, the, the only sin in the camp was not Achan's sin, and he's the one who gets busted for the sin. I'll give you this short version in a moment but the sin in the camp really begins with Joshua and his little staff of leaders there why because unlike Jericho there's no mention that they prayed there's no mention that they sought God's battle plan Lord what do you want us to do they just seen a mighty miracle they would taken a city and they barely had to do anything except walk around and blow some trumpets and, and shout and, and now they're like, well, we got this one. They really didn't because Achan had sinned. Now, what they do is, is you know, a bunch of guys get killed, and, and then, then everybody's mourning and weeping, and they're like, how could this happen? And, and so Joshua is instructed by the Lord, because at this point he says, oh, maybe I should ask the Lord what to do. It's always a good idea. It would have worked earlier. So he goes and he asks the Lord, what am I supposed to do now? And he says, have all the tribes pass by. And then from each tribe, pick the clan. And from each clan, pick a family. And from each family, we'll pick uh, an individual. And so that's exactly what happens. Pretty much an all-day process. It's a lot of people, but all the tribes and all the clans and all the families. And it comes down to a guy named Achan. And it's pretty sad if you read the story because it, it, it mentions his dad and his granddad. And, and it's like, it's a family thing here. The, the shame isn't just his. The, the pain isn't just his. And so when he's busted because, well, it's time to confess, everybody knows. By the way, you can check all this out in Joshua 7 later. And, and so, and you should. But um, when they finally say, okay, come clean, what did you do? What happened? Achan confesses. And, and here's his confession. It's in, in uh, Joshua 7.20. He says, indeed, I've sinned against the Lord God of Israel, and this is what I've done. So he confesses that he sinned against God. And then he says, when I saw among the spoils a beautiful Babylonian garment, 200 shekels of silver, a wedge of gold weighing 50 shekels. I coveted them and took them. Six words. I saw, I coveted, and took. I would say I saw, I coveted, I took. And that's, that's how he fell. And it didn't just cost him. It cost the nation. 
men died in the process. Now, there's some really good news in 1 John. I like to share it as much as I like to share it's not God's will any perish, but all come to repentance. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. But I want to say that while that's absolutely true, and, and if you haven't tried it lately, you should. And if you're one of those that's like, Lord, if it's anything I've done to offend you lately, come on. You know there's not anything I might have done. But anyway, he specifically says what he'd done. I saw, I coveted, I took. But listen, 36 men died. Because of his sin. 36 men died because Joshua and the fellas didn't go to the Lord in prayer. And didn't ask for a plan. So it's not all on him. But but God is judging them because of him. And so Achan's sin led to the death of 36. So his people are instructed to stone him to death. And they did. There are dozens, if not hundreds, of illustrations in Scripture of the danger of covetousness, of the danger of greed, of the danger of of thinking that stuff is more important than people and relationships, and for God, that is never going to work. Verse 23, he who receives seed on the good ground, prepared soil, plowed and prepared and weeded and and watched over the one who receives seed on the good ground is he who hears the word and understands it i would hope that's all of you today who indeed bears fruit and produces some a hundredfold and some 60 and some 30 the good ground they hear it they understand it and the seed takes root The shoot pops up, the fruit grows, there's a harvest. And you know, because this is an agricultural region, that the seed for more fruit is always in the first fruits. So if you plant, if you want oranges, you don't stick an orange in the ground, you just get orange seeds. And you put them in the ground and you don't grow an orange, you grow an orange tree. And each seed can produce not One orange, but a whole tree that can produce a lot of oranges, that can produce a lot more. So you can start with a seed or two and end up with a huge orchard. And and so it is with the word of God. That's his intention, that everything would reproduce and reproduce after its own kind. They were having a little crisis in the early church. Some of the believers were saying, you know, I follow Paul. And others were saying, well, I follow Apollos. And some are saying, well, I'm with Peter, and he's one of the original 12. And and Paul's saying, hey, this doesn't make any sense. Did I die for you? Did they die for you? No, this is supposed to be about Jesus. And listen, it's 1 Corinthians 6, 3, 6. I planted, Apollos watered, and God gave the increase. So then neither is he who plants is anything, nor he who waters, but God who gives the increase. He who plants and he who waters are one, and each one will receive his own reward according to his own labor. So we pray, and we plant, and we pray, and we water, and we pray, and we just wait on the Lord to bring the harvest. We don't plant a seed and then dig it up the next day to say, what's going on? I don't see any growth. And sometimes we expect too much of somebody who just came to Christ and far too little from those of us who've walked for decades with Christ. Listen, he's the good shepherd. Mentioned it earlier, we're under shepherds. He's the light of the world. We're privileged to shine for him in this dark and desperate generation. He provides the seed. He prepares the soil. He promises a harvest And we get to participate in the process. A couple other things to consider, and then we're going to worship together. If your heart's bad, there's good news. God can use you anyway. Jonah hated Ninevites. He said, I'm not even even going to go tell them that they're going to die. Just kill them. And uh, and, and he ran, and we talked about it recently. and, And so 
God just used him anyway. Now, that doesn't mean that's the best that can happen. You know, he got the work done, but Jonah never softened his heart. He had no joy in the midst of the greatest revival. Well, I don't, it's not really a revival because they weren't dead. In the great midst of the greatest revival that ever happened, he had no joy because his heart wasn't in it, because his heart was hard, because his heart was weedy, because his, his, his heart was corrupted. There's even better news, though. If your heart's bad, God does heart transplants. Promises in the Old Testament, he'll take the stony heart away, that hardened heart, that, that heart that doesn't really love, doesn't love him with all our heart and soul and mind and strength, doesn't love people the way he loves us and loves those people. He will give you a new heart. And that's what we all need. Turns out that, it, that you know, the, the problems... At, at their heart are matters and problems of the heart. So if your heart's bad, God does heart replacements. And, and, and here's some evidence of it. Paul hated Christians, but God confronted him and converted him and gave him a heart for Christians, for Jews and Gentiles. And the last time I looked, that's all there is. Christians, Jews, and Gentiles. James and John hated Samaritans. But John in his latter years known as the disciple or the apostle of love. The world is filled with hate. The world is filled with haters. And the one way we can best shine for him is to love them even if they hate us, even if they persecute us, even in the midst of false accusation, to love as he does because God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. It's a simple test. Are you of the world or are you of Jesus? Are you with the world or are you with Jesus? If you're a hater, you're of the world. If you're a lover, you're with the Lord. Lord, thank you for your words today. And I pray that mine will only have added clarity and in application, I, I pray you'd weed out any nonsense that might come from me and just cause the truth of your word to impact every heart. And I pray for my brothers and sisters that everything you say to us would take root and that it would produce fruit and that there would be an abundant harvest, Lord that that one little seed planted today in someone's heart and mind would produce a plant that produces an orchard, that produces, well, that your word would continue to go out and transform this hurting, needy world. And if you've never surrendered your life to the Lord Jesus, perhaps you've known all your life that Jesus exists and that he came and lived among us and died for us and rose again miraculously and even that he's coming again, I knew that my entire life, but I never surrendered it, my life, till I was 27. And I don't know how old you are today, and it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter how long you've known those things. What matters is, do you believe them, and have you acted on them? And if you've never heard it before, that's okay. Because if you understand today that you're a sinner, and Jesus died for your sins, was buried, and rose again, and he did all that because he loved you and wants you with him eternally. There's forgiveness and life in Jesus. All you must do is confess your need for him and give your life to the one who gave his life for you. So if you're ready to do that while every head's bowed, every eye's closed, every Christian's praying, they know you're in the valley of decision. They know that you are in a place they once sat where, where they had to decide for or against Jesus. And we're all praying you'll decide for him. That you'll move from darkness to light. From deception to truth. From, from, from hatred to love. And if that's you, raise your hand today. Right now, I'll pray for you. I'll pray with you. And the miracle that saved our lives and is transforming our lives will begin in you. Anyone this hour, this service, this moment ready to say yes to Jesus for now and forever.
Lord, you've drawn us, you love us, and we're so grateful for you and for your word. Draw us in, Lord, as we read ahead. Bless us with insight into these next six parables we'll be considering in the next couple weeks. Thank you for this wonderful holiday season. And may you be at the center of all our fellowship this year. In Jesus' name, amen.